How many of us know Stephen Harper? <laughs> All right, only one hand, really? All right, let me put, put it the other way. If you don't know him, raise your hand. Okay. I've met him, but briefly. <laughs> okay. Does that not make you know him? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. What would make you know him? If you actually went over his house, had tea, that sort of stuff. <laughs> but we read so much about him in the newspaper, don't we? Mm -hmm. oh, we watch him on television. Doesn't that make us know him? Yeah. No. <laughs> that was a sharp no. And rightly so. Because we get to know so much about him. But to get to know the person, we've got to get close and really close to him. And Jock is the right in telling us, well, I have some glimpse of the man because I just distantly met him. To get to know him, I must shake his hand, talk to him in person, live with him, spend time with him. And then I say, yeah, I get to know him. I know when he gets angry, when he doesn't know, not what I read, but what I experienced. And the story is true about many of us who say, we know the Lord Jesus. Do we really? <laughs> but I'm glad to note that a good many of us are saying, we want to meet this Jesus. We want to get to know him. We want to lift him up in all our lives. And it's reflected okay. in the kind of study that we have chosen. And that is the greatest thing that ever we can do on earth. Meet this being called Jesus and experience him here and now. And the reason is simple. There is only one entrance to heaven. And that entrance is, ah, only a head one voice. That entrance is, yes, that's the only entrance. I am the way, says Jesus, the truth and the life. No one, not a single person goes to heaven except through. There we are. And the text before us makes that very, very clear. Because it says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that no one. I don't want you to be unaware. And when he says, I don't want you to be unaware, unaware, unaware of what? There is a person that you must experience. There is a person that you need to meet. There is a person that you need to know. And I want you to be aware of this. That if all that you undertake to be and do does not spring from the knowledge of this person, you are lost. Now that doesn't sound good, does it? But it's a plain fact. It all must spring from, originate from, and be directed by the Lord Jesus. So three questions will suffice in making us understand this the curse of today. And rightly so, that he should be the vine and we the branches. So that we may be, I, I like Ruth's word, simple and nice. It's true. Connected to him. That connection is very important. I ask myself the question, is the Christ present in me? Am I aware? That's what he's saying. I don't want you to be unaware. So, am I aware? Do I realize? Do I experience? Do I know that the Christ is present with me? The Lord Jesus Christ shares his nature with us. And many of us know, at least all of us have heard, and if we've forgotten, we are reminded that Ephesians and chapter 3. No, chapter 1, verse 13, says, You heard the word of truth, you believed that word of truth, and when you did, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. See those, those steps? Hear, believe, get sealed. Why did we 
here. We have the Lord Jesus. Who did we believe? We believe the Lord Jesus. And to show that he accepted our faith, he sealed us with his promised Holy Spirit. That's how we have the presence of Jesus. That's how we have the shared nature of Jesus. He gave us his nature. The third chapter of John's Gospel tells us, that which is born of the physical body is a physical human being. So that which is born of the Spirit of God shares in the spirit nature of the God who has brought about that birth. Is there upon you the realization, therefore, that God in Christ has shared with you his own nature? That's how Christ is present with us. But when did he become present with you? When did he become present with me? It's not something that we are born with. For he tells those who are alive, this Jesus, unless you are born a second time, you cannot enter the domain of God. Unless you believe, and we don't believe in our wombs, we haven't heard in there. We believe when we are born, we don't believe when we are unintelligent. We believe when we hear. And when did you hear and believe? And when did you get that sealing? That's how Christ presents himself to us. And when he does do that, he actually shines through us. Because the reason he shares his nature with us is that we might show forth that nature and shine with his nature. I don't want to be unaware. You are now brethren. And that's exactly what moves us into the second point. If we have Christ present in us, is he powerful in us? In other words, is he operating in us enough to push the me out so that he may bring the Christ in? The moment I say I am a Christian, I say I have lost the me, to he who is called Christ, so that he is now the dominant factor in me, and now the one pressed down. In the words of John the Baptist, he must increase, and I must decrease. I wonder who the people see when they look at you, who people see when they look at me. Do they just remember our physical features? Or does something go beyond that so that they might say, well, I know it is John I saw, but there was something about John that I just can't put a finger on. And you, John, should say, that something you can't put a finger on speaks the presence of someone in me who took me away from sin and brought me to himself. Is that a testimony born about you? I don't want you to be unaware, and he says, you were carried away. That means now, that's past. You were carried away. Led to dumb idols. There were things you were interested in. There were things that captivated you. There are things that just took you along, and you went along with it. You were, but that's past. It's gone. You may be looked at now, and it will be realized you are very different from what you were then. Because you are this different person now. Christ, powerful in you. Kicking out the unwanted, bringing in the wanted. Kicking out the bad, bringing in the good. So it can be said about you. He is not the same person. She is not the same person. Not for bad, but for good. Is that a testimony born about you? That's what the Christ does when he comes in us. Does that mean we unduly, unnecessarily offend people? No. The very opposite. We begin to develop the same care for people that God the Savior has for us. Because we realize that the best thing that has happened to us is that God has not only taken us away from our sin and failure, He has actually washed us clean from it. 
and brought us to himself. And we can say in all of our experiences, nothing is richer, sweeter, or better than that experience. And if I can't say that, and if you can't, it's time we examined ourselves to ask who we really are in the sight of God. The last question. Is Christ proclaiming himself in me? If he is present in me, if he is powerful in me, then he is visible through me and audible through me. So, I am the expression and the visible expression of the invisible God on this earth. Are you that? Some people have said Christians are the only Bible that some people will ever read. Does the Bible become alive because of the sight of you? Does the Bible become alive because of the words you speak? Does the Bible minister to human beings because of who you turn out to be? The Christ who has shared his nature with you has saved you from the sinful nature and he now shines through you that he may show himself the onlooking world. Is that happening with you? How else can Christianity become effective if those who lay claim to belong to it and to be it don't shine forth with it? And the Bible does say about us, we go forth shining as in the midnight darkness. And not a little while ago, not so long ago, somebody among us Sunday school storytellers did bring that picture of how light, it doesn't matter how dark the room is, will simply be visible because light always defeats the darkness. And the world of sin is darkness. And that's why people hide the bad they do from those who don't like the bad they do so that they may seem to be good to them and just shy away when they should be caught in it. How much more must we be shamed when God should be the one who catches us in our bad things? And this is all the story of the Corinthian people because they are problems with one another, jealousy with one another, fighting for names and boasting about their giftings and they're just competing with themselves. Even when it comes to the Lord's table, those who are rich are showing that they are better food than those who are less privileged. And so they are rattled with so many devils. And that's why Paul says, you are very immature. You are not showing the Christ in you. Wake up and come to the reality of what the true faith is and shine forth in the Christ. For no one can say Jesus be accursed if they belong to God. So in other words, no one who can say they belong to Jesus does the things Jesus doesn't want because that is to curse and to disown and to shame and to discard Jesus. No one who says he belongs to Jesus goes that way. But the one who belongs to Jesus says Jesus is Lord. And the only way to say Jesus is Lord is to do the wants of Jesus, to do the pleasure of Jesus, to run away from sin, and to do the pleasures of God. Who is doing that? If we who call ourselves Christians don't do it, who will? A little girl, blind, is selling at a very busy, selling merchandise, apples, name it oranges, whatever, at a very busy airport. Some men who work in the local city have been asked to go and work in a different city, but there's only one plane which leaves that morning, returns that night, and doesn't go until a few days later. And so all the men are eager to catch the plane and go and they do that. On their return, they realize just a few minutes before the plane should leave, and if they don't go, they won't see their families, and they won't earn money by going to work in their stations. So they rush to the airport. In the process of running, 
they run into this girl who is selling her merchandise and her apples and oranges go everywhere. And the man said, we will miss the plane. <laughs> Woman, take care of your merchandise. We are running. And just as he was about to enter the gate, this old man turns around, walks back, and begins to turn, pick up the apples one by one and the oranges, puts them in a basket, then takes them to the girl. It's at that moment that he realizes the girl is blind. So he gives her, here's your stuff. Then he looks at all the bad apples, removes them, and pays for them. Then he says, okay, here's the remainder of it. I'm going away. What's your name? The man doesn't answer, just walks away. Then the girl says, you've done this good to me. Very few people are that good. Sir, answer this question. Are you Jesus? <laughs> when I ask myself, how many times has somebody asked me, are you Jesus? How many times has anybody asked you, are you Jesus? If we carry ourselves about the way Jesus' disciples ought to carry themselves about, because we reflect the Master, it will be seen that we have been with Jesus. Is it sin in you? Let's pray. Holy Father, we bless your name for the Christ who comes to be present in us on the day we believe and so powerful in us that he kills the human side of us to raise that part of him that has come to find itself in us in order that we may be in word and deed proclaimers of the Christ because for this very reason we are kept on this earth, that we may declare the glories of him who has passed us off from darkness into his marvelous light. Allow, dear Father, that as many as have tested on the kindness of the Lord may rise to this level of commitment, because that's the glorious task. You have left to sons of men to do while we are on this earth. And thank you for the band of pilgrims of Passover Baptist Church who love you enough to be glued to you and to shake off themselves that they may actually just share the Christ alive in them. Father, grow in each one of us, and flood our lives with your precious spirit, and we return your thanks for that. We pray you will be with those of our number who aren't with us in the course of today. Some because they are attending to dear ones, those who are dear to them, who aren't too well, and others because necessity calls and they must sell themselves over to certain chores or certain other commitments, avail yourselves to them, dear Father. May they remember this as your Lord's Day, your day, and spend it as such, even the settings in which they are aware of the fact that you've not forgotten about them and are thinking about them. Our Father, we think of the threats that have been made by the Russian people in spying out several lands and lately trying to encroach upon the lands of Canada. And we pray that you give uh, forces the might with which to repel such threats as that. But over and above, oh dear Father, that you give these, our leaders and those who with them seek global peace, the means with which to maintain that, for we know you are a God of peace. Father, we have numerous members of our congregation that are in body and well, and those of our communities also who are ailing, visit with them and let them find and see in you that gracious healer who does take away all forms of ill health, and when you don't do that, 
do give the strength with which to withstand the testings that we go through in our frail bodies. But we pray again that you cause each one of us to see that we have a song to sing in the name of Jesus and with song we must sing not for some time but in word and in action all the while you are pleased to lend us breath and help us do that with all of our being. And to you, our Father, we again in obedience to your Son pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 